Hi, this is Eric. This is episode 26 of Survival Medicine. This is basic extremity fracture diagnosis and care. The idea was sent in from uh, Bones World 98 um, asking about uh, detecting various broken bones and how to treat them. So this initially sounded like a, a easy, straightforward uh, thing to put together from my standpoint, but the more I thought about it, I'm like, boy, this gets kind of complicated. Um, we're going to have a couple pictures. It may gross a few people out, so here's your fair warning. So what are we going to talk about? Well, because it got really complicated to consider all the different you know, fractures, and you were talking about nasal fractures or facial fractures or skull or cervical spine, all these different things, it got really complicated and uh, and difficult. So I thought, well, I'll pare things down and just go with some common, simple, basic things. And so we're just going to talk about the extremities, arms and legs. Um, we're not going to do anything else. We're not going to talk about dislocations. We're not going to talk about pelvic fractures or anything like that. So this is just some basic stuff uh, for the arms and legs. Now, when you're analyzing a patient that has a potential fracture, you got to look at several different things. Number one, you got to figure out what's the blood flow past the area of fracture because sometimes the fracture can either push on or damage a vessel uh, so that blood flow uh, past the area of fracture is impaired and so there's a couple things you can do uh, you can check pulses uh, you know past that area of fracture so there's the radial pulse that's by the base of your thumb uh, there's also uh, pulses in your feet there's one on the top of the foot and then there's one behind uh, sort of the bony ankle uh, and so you could uh, kind of find out where those are and, and practice feeling for those so you know what uh, what they feel like. And you also need to figure out how what's the nerve function uh, and you know distal the fracture again. Just like you can damage an artery, you can also damage a nerve. So you want to feel um, areas of the skin past the fracture uh, in multiple locations. Make sure the nerve function is all good. You want to check tendon, you know, can you open and close the hands, can you make a strong fist, can you hold your fingers out, kind of like your hands putting up for a stop sign, like you're giving somebody the warning to stop. You hold the fingers in that position uh, firmly, and then you push down like you're trying to make them close in on a fist, uh, and make sure the, uh, the patient can hold their fingers out, uh, again, checking the tendon function. Um, you want to assess for t infection potential. Uh, was there a break in the skin at the area of the fracture? That would be a big deal. And then something called compartment syndrome that will develop uh, later, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Now, wilderness injuries, so if you're out and about doing normal things in the woods, about 70-80% um, are related to musculoskeletal and soft tissue injuries. So this is going to be scrapes, bumps, bruises, lacerations, and breaks. So what is a fracture? Well, basically it's a break in the bone. Um, a broken bone and fracture the same thing. And there's different types. There's a green stick, which is a partial break. Um, the fracture can be described as being angulated, displaced, shortened, rotated. We'll talk about that in a slide here in just a second. And these fractures can either be open or closed. Uh, a closed fracture means that there's no break in the skin. There's no communication from bacteria that live on the skin that can get into that broken bone. An open fracture is where the bone is broken through the skin, torn in the skin, um, and exposed to all the bacteria that live on the outside of the body and that can be a major major problem. Now if there's just a slight scratch over the skin if it's at the level of the break we assume it's open until proven otherwise. So here's a picture of a green stick fracture. Uh, these two arrows show where it's sort of buckled um, on the narrow, more narrow bone um, which is the ulna uh, you can see the little fracture lines uh, on the opposite side of the bone is the arrow with the, the handle to it. The arrow that's just the triangle without the handle, you can see a bump in the bone there. Uh, that's also a buckle or green stick fracture. Uh, so these fractures don't go all the way through the bone and the bones are pretty much in proper alignment. Now here's another uh, fracture. This bone is the radius. Uh, the yellow arrow uh, for the image on the left hand side shows some displacement uh, so one bone is displaced about 50 to 60 percent compared to the other bone um, the image on the right which is the same fracture the same bone that's broken it's just a side view rather than kind of on the top of the arm this shows an angulation 
Uh, so you can look at that. That's probably you know close to 40, somewhere between 40 and 50 degrees angulation, uh, and that should be straight. So one is uh, displacement, one is angulation. If the bone segments were far apart, that's called distraction. Uh, here's basically that same fracture, but uh, looking at it without the x-ray, just looking with the skin, you can see an obvious bend in the arm. Uh, and this is a gentleman that I took care of that uh, wrecked his motorcycle. Uh, no question there that there's a break in the leg. There's another view. And you can see the laceration on his shin, but that laceration's up high, away from the area of the break. So that laceration on the shin, I'm not worried about as an open fracture. Uh, if that laceration were right at that bend where the bone is broken, then that would be a different story. Now here is clearly an open fracture. You can see the bone sticking out from the ankle, uh, and this would be a major problem for us. So open fractures are a surgical emergency. They really need to go to the operating room. They need to be washed out aggressively, and they need to be put on antibiotics uh, because you can get an infection of the bone, which is called osteomyelitis, and this will slowly destroy the bone. It can cause a lot of problems. And again, so if there's an open fracture, if at all possible, these people need to get to the operating room uh, for surgical treatment. Uh, if you have the chance of updating their tetanus status, those, this would be a great time to do that if their tetanus is out of date. So what is an out of date tetanus, by the way? Uh, if they haven't had a tetanus within the last five years suffering this kind of wound, they would need a tetanus booster. All right, <clears throat> let's say that we're worried that there's a fracture. Uh, we don't see a massive bend in the arm or bend in the leg, but the uh, person's pretty tender uh, right in a specific spot. And so we are trying to think, well, without an x-ray, how can I tell this is broken? Well, you can actually use a 128 hertz tuning fork and a stethoscope uh, sort of is a uh, poor man's fracture detector, you know, poor man's x-ray. And how you work this and, um, is you ring the tuning fork and you place it on one end of the bone and on the other end of the same bone, you listen with the stethoscope. Now, if the bone is broken, uh, the sound will be muted. It won't transmit sound loudly as it would if, uh, if the bone is intact. You can do the same bone but on the opposite side of the body as a comparison to make sure that it sounds um, different or the same. Uh, and so that's kind of how you do it. Now, this worked pretty well. When they studied this in the Journal of Athletic Training, um, it was pretty good. You know, 80% sensitivity, 80% specificity. Um, definitely not perfect, but something that's very, very reasonable and something that I use when I'm out in the field and don't have access to x-rays. So this is how you do it. Again, you put the stethoscope on one end of the bone and the tuning fork on, uh, you know, where you can reach and feel the bone at the other end. And again, it's always good to compare to the unaffected side. So if the right arm is injured, you listen and then you listen to the same area on the left arm and compare it and see how it, it, it does. Now if we're worried that some uh, bone is fractured, we need to splint it. Uh, one thing that I really like to have in my kit and I use a lot of is uh, the SAM splint. Uh, these are pretty cheap, easy to get. You can get them on Amazon. Uh, and here's a couple splints. If you're worried about a forearm fracture, you can do um, these simple splints, the double layer wrist splint, uh, which just kind of goes along the what we call the volar side of the arm or the same side that the palm points to. Uh, to immobilize that. You can do uh, an ankle stirrup if you're worried about either a really bad sprain or you're worried that the ankle might be uh, fractured. Uh, this wraps around the ankle so it goes from about the mid portion of the shin down around the bottom of the foot and back up to the mid portion of the shin. Uh, that's called an ankle stirrup splint. If you're worried that the humerus is fractured or the upper arm, um, we use this humeral shaft splint and so it's like a J shaped uh, so it goes from your shoulder area down around the elbow and then up on the inside of the arm uh, just past the elbow maybe to the mid portion of the, the upper arm and then you immobilize these with wraps. Here's another example of a volar uh, wrist splint. Now when you're splinting the upper arm um, the forearm or the wrist, you need to put the hand in a neutral position or a position of function. So the wrist is slightly bent back and the hand is, is sort of cupped. Kind of like if you just rested your hand, if you put your arm down on a table and just rested your hand, you, s you can see sort of a natural position of function. 
Uh, the other thing is the uh, what we call the beer can position or coke can position. So as if you were holding a, a, tw a 12 ounce trophy can, uh, you can just imagine what the, the shape of your wrist and hand would be and that would is also considered a neutral position. Here's a picture of an ankle stirrup splint. You can see where it goes from one side down around the leg and then back up. And if you're splinting for potential fracture, uh, here's some, some key points. If you've got bony prominences, so look at your wrist right now. Uh, and so on the part of your wrist that's on the opposite side of your thumb, so on the kind of the pinky, um, that's your ulnar. And you can see a bump, uh, a bone right there on the back side of your wrist. Um, if you could pad that with some cotton or other things so that when you put the splint on, if you happen to have a splint that will push on that, it doesn't rub or cause problems or break the skin down. Now, the key thing also is making this fracture as straight as possible. And this can be quite uncomfortable. Um, in the emergency room, it's nice because we have all kinds of great medicines we can give to kind of knock people out to get these bones straight. Uh, but if you're taking care of a, uh, a person that is not going to have any access to medical care, you're in some remote wilderness place or traveling uh, overseas in the third world, uh, it might be reasonable to do what you can to make this fracture straight. Uh, the way that I manipulate fractures is I use both hands. I put my thumbs on the area of the fracture and then I use the top part of my fingers to then bend back as I push my thumbs to uh, align and straighten a bone. It can take a reasonable amount of pressure. Uh, this grosses some people out because as you move that bone you feel the bones crunch and crack uh, as you move them back into position. Uh, but getting this as straight as possible will give you the best chances of proper healing and useful function of the arm or leg later. Fractures take about six weeks to heal, so you want to keep this immobilized for about six weeks. Um, for the first period of time uh, as it's healing and you're going to have the maximum swelling, you need to check for compartment syndrome. And again, we're going to talk about that in just a second. And then if you're in doubt, if you're worried, I'm not sure if this is broken, but it sure seems pretty tender, then just splint it. Uh, you can always check them in a week and see if they're uh, completely better or whether they're still tender and can decide to continue the splint at that point. Uh, but when in doubt, if you have any concerns, just go ahead and splint them. So what is compartment syndrome? Now, if you get a lot of swelling due to this fracture or injury, um, pressures can build up inside these tissue uh, compartments that you have in, in your arm and your leg and several different parts of your body. And if this pressure uh, exceeds what the arteries or nerves can deal with, then it will permanently uh, damage them. Uh, so it can actually shut off blood supply to the portion uh, past the fracture or past the compartment sir, um, syndrome or permanently damage the, damage the nerve. The first symptom a patient will have with developing a compartment syndrome is increasing pain. So if somebody's just complaining of being more and more uncomfortable due to the fracture because uh, normally right when you break it is where it hurts the most and then it slowly gets better but if the next day there's it's hurting a lot more than it did the prior day that should be a tip off that maybe there's a compartment syndrome going on other symptoms will uh, be numbness as the nerve gets damaged uh, loss of pulses the inability to move the extremity due to pain and then finally a cold extremity where the blood supply is shut off Another thing to consider is what they call passive motion. Um, so let's say you have a break in the mid portion of your forearm. If I'm able to bend your wrist back and forth, if that passive motion causes exquisite pain, then I worry that perhaps there's a compartment syndrome there. And that, that's a passive motion means the patient's not moving the wrist, but you're moving the wrist. So you just take and gently rock the wrist back and forth where you keep the fracture still um, and see if that has a lot of what we call passive pain. If compartment syndrome is untreated, uh, again, permanent damage in the muscles and nerves, uh, and it could even leave the extremity useless at some point. Now the problem with compartment syndrome is it's a surgical fix. You have to go in there and cut and release the compartment pressures so that the uh, muscles have a chance to expand through the uh, opening of the cut um, and, and take away that, that tight, tight pressure that develops. Uh, here's w what's called a fasciotomy uh, on a leg uh, to relieve compartment syndrome. Uh, this is healing. You can. This has been present for a while and it's uh, being allowed to heal slowly and just left open. Here's a picture in the operating room of a compartment syndrome relief of a forearm. 
uh, and you can see the very large incision that's made that will be left open um, for the muscles to have some room to expand uh, so that it takes away the pressure. Now I found a couple resources. Uh, there's a uh, this is actually put together by a medical student. It's expeditiondoc.com, um, and there's some videos about putting on splints. I think that's a pretty good resource to check out. Also, if you go to the uh, SAM Medical site, which is sammedical.com, and go to the SAM Splint section, uh, they've got videos and PDFs and instructions about how to immobilize different parts of the body, including the thumb, the fingers, the you know the wrist, the leg. Uh, and so that's definitely something, if you're going to use a SAM splint, take time to go to their website and learn how to apply these splints. Again, they're cheap. Um, you know, you can have one that you keep you know, sort of in the wrapper, uh, so to speak, if you need it. Get an extra one, open it up, practice using it, make different splints uh, so that you learn how to do this. It's not too complicated, and it can be a great help. So again, thanks for watching. Um, I really appreciate all the comments and everything, that, all the feedback that people provide. Uh, it makes doing all this worth it. Um, and I hope that's helpful. And uh, send me any questions, and we'll go from there. Thanks again.